Yeah, so we have time for a question and answer, and I really get to play talk show host because I will come and bring you the mic. Um, and just as a disclaimer, um, I like to tell people, just like ask questions, don't tell monologues. <laughs> it's okay, Katie, I'm on the stage. <laughs> <laughs> that was actually for Wesley. I know. Um, I and always I have, ask the most complicated questions. Th that's actually <laughs> true. Um, <laughs> So I actually have 10 uh, little tatlies to give away of the arrows and the um, sort of butterflies bugs. and moths and bugs. Um, so I, the first 10 people to ask questions, um, <laughs> I'll give you a tatly. Also, I have the giveaway for the tickets. <laughs> but I'm going to keep you in suspense. <laughs> <laughs> yes, over here. So when you're doing print or paint or, or kind of more physical art, mm -hmm. um, you're pretty much in control of the color and it's going to get reproduced faithfully everywhere it goes. Um, a lot of us probably work on the web. I have two monitors. Colors change when I switch monitors. The color didn't change, but the, the representation of it did. How do you deal with that as a designer? You don't. <laughs> um, just even today, like some of the slides on a projection screen versus a backlit, um, you know, monitor. Um, you know, I could say that the way you deal with it is you don't use those colors. But you know, you have to try to make things the way that you want it to be for the most people possible, and assuming and hoping that people are. You know, you, you kind of study your client base. Um, I know with me, with web, I do a lot of analytics and find out, okay, my typical user is using Google Chrome on a Mac. So I can pretty much guarantee, I know that all Mac environments are gonna be using a similar color palette versus a PC. So that can kind of like, okay, do I really care about the PC users? Eh, maybe not. You know, and I kind of use that as kind of a, a, a mantra for it. but. I mean, painting, I mean, I have a background in printmaking. Yeah, you completely have every bit of control, and you can modify it depending on your paper choice, your canvas, or whatever. Um, so you just kind of kind of go with the flow. Yeah. Make it. I have a moth. Oh. You're welcome. <laughs> Hi. So when you're doing branding work, um, mm -hmm. are there any colors that you specifically avoid just across the board? No. No. No, it's all about what's appropriate. There's no bad colors. It's just about how they're used. Um, you know, while I may not purposely go towards Pepto Bismol pink for something, it might be the perfect color for someone. You know, so I, I don't rule out something just because of a personal prejudice. I, I kind of I listen to my clients. Um, you know, as a designer, especially an in-house designer or not in-house, but a, a freelance designer. Um, if you say, I will never use blue, well then what happens if your client wants blue and they're paying your bills, you know? You gotta do a blue that you're happy with. So, you know, try to keep that in mind and like, you know, yes, you can kind of steer people in colors that you like or like this year I love, you know, greens. Well, okay, I'll try to use as much green as possible in my branding, but it may not work. And, you know, you shouldn't build a, a brand around a color that you like, you should brand brand something because of the colors that your client likes and what will work for them. Does that make sense? Hi. Hello. I think a lot of people are afraid of color. Um, so in choosing color, I think people have a lot of fear. Do you, have you ever chosen a color for a client and then regretted it later? Ooh. <laughs> no, but I've had clients that had colors that I've had to use and I hated them. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, before I came to Baltimore, I worked for the University of Southern Mississippi as an in-house print designer. Um, and their color palette is black and gold. And their gold is, for all printing purposes, PMS 123 for uncoated, and, or for coated paper, and PMS 115 for uncoated. That will be forever ingrained in my head because those are the two most vile yellows ever. <laughs> um, but you have to deal with it. And so I've tried to figure out ways to pair it with colors that would overwhelm that yellow <laughs> or like use a lot of black <laughs> and like accents of yellow and so you can kind of work with it but I've never personally picked colors that I've been terrified of um, because kind of my rule of thumb is that if I'm not happy with it I'm not giving it to you you know so I, I know that I would come later on and have to design something and I still have to use those colors you know and it wouldn't make sense to pick something that awful so 
Um, in the clip uh, running with scissors, I was struck that by uh, that you thought the yellow was bright and the blue was somber mm -hmm. when I saw them the opposite. So I'm wondering, are there any scientific studies about how people see colors and what do those studies say? There's tons of studies about color and color theory and how it affects personalities and, and things. Um, I cannot give you a definitive answer on like what the scientists say, but I know that like, you know, Yellow typically for me, or from my experience, seems to be happier and kind of like, you know, joyful. Blue is a little bit more depressive because it's cooler, it's calmer. Yellow is a little bit more exciting. Um, if I want to like make a design really seem inviting, I'll use warmer colors than cooler colors. Co cooler colors kind of make things bring down the tone a little bit. Um, so if I find that blue, even though it is a kind of an uplifting blue, because it's kind of you know, a youthful, childlike blue in that, in that clip, um, it still is very, it's kind of melancholy because it's not sad, it's just not you know, boisterous and happy at the same time. So, but I find the yellow to be, I, I find like in that particular clip, Deirdre surrounded herself in yellow because I think she probably thought that it would make her happier if she was around happy colors. So, you know, I think a lot of people, and I grew up with, a, with family members that have mental illness, and so being around people that have mental, mental illnesses, you see that they try to surround themselves with things that will make them happier and kind of, you know, lessen their pain of things. And so I kind of see that in that film. Does that make sense? Yeah. How you doing? My name is Reginald Smith. Hey. Um, when you paint, when you self uh, create, so to speak, something that you're just doing for your own personal pleasure, do you have to be in uh, any particular state of mind to use various colors? For example, like uh, I know Betty Edwards states that the color purple means royalty. So if you're using purple, would that mean you feel as though you're in a higher place or a high spirits with yourself when you do that? Um, yes and no. Um, yes, I feel like there are definitely days where I see color very vividly and exciting, and then some days where it's very dark and dim and little contrast, and that does, change based on the weather and how I feel with that. I, it's kind of odd, I get seasonal depression, but I get it during the summer. I hate hot weather. So like when it gets hot and sunny and long days, I just want to stay inside and don't want to do anything versus in the winter I get a little bit happier and I actually am, am more productive, I feel like. So that does affect me. Um, as far as if I use purple, am I trying to say that I am referencing that I feel like royalty or whatever. No, I might use purple to try to influence the viewer that the brand that I'm doing is more royal than it is. Um, that, you know, definitely the psychology of what colors are used for um, historically is important. Um, like lapis lazuli is like one of the most gorgeous blues ever. Um, and uh, Giotto did this whole ceiling in a chapel in, uh, I think it's Padua, or. In, in Italy, and um, that ceiling, when it was created, frescoed, was more expensive than 14 karat gold um, because it was, you know, crushed lapis, and like it was so rare to find. And so, because of that, that particular blue is extremely important. Um, and I think it's actually kind of funny I, that little bit of history of importance of color actually hits the mainstream in movies like Devil Wears Prada, where they're picking on. Um, uh, I just went to this blank. What is her name? Anne yeah, Anne Hathaway. Um, yeah, anyway, um, th that she was wearing a blue sweater, and, and Meryl Streep goes, Well, actually, that blue was picked by Dior, and blah, 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 and it has all these meanings. And it's actually very poignant because that color at one point was the wealthiest. So I think it's kind of interesting that that has made its way into culture. Um, definitely, if you see royal purple or golds, we have an aff affiliation with royalty. but. I, I don't think if I choose those colors, I'm feeling royal. I think I'm trying to portray that, that brand as the royal. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Do you mix your colors and also name them? Hmm. Depends on medium. Um, I, I've done projects where, in printmaking specifically, where I'm literally mixing 
actual pigments and making color that I kind of make humorous names for it. I did a project with uh, Suni Na, which is a, an illustrator and, and printmaker um, that's from Malaysia that I met while living in Mississippi. And she did these illustrations and I printed them. And I mixed colors for her. And she would come to me saying, hey, I want this shade of like metallic, you know, whatever color, or she picked, uh, picked up one day a, a safety or a push pin off of a, a, a push pin board, and it was like fluorescent orange. And I'm like, oh, come on, I can't make fluorescent ink out of like, you know, basic you know, colors here. And so we worked as hard as possible, and we came up with Suni's fluorescent orange, and we kind of nicknamed it that. Um, so, yeah, but for web and stuff, um, no, I don't necessarily mix and name things. I mean, it's always very analytical. The hex value is six digits of whatever, that's the color it is. I don't give it a name. Um, or for print make, or for print design, I use Pantone matching system pretty much exclusively. So I always say PMS, blah, blah, blah. Um, so I never give those a name. Those are all subjective, I think. So um, if I say olive, you know, you may have a, an idea of what olive is. You may have an idea, but my idea can be different. So I don't want to give that name out. If I say this PMS color, there's no confusion. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, all right. <laughs> um, I'm really only asking because I want to talk to you. <laughs> That's A-OK. -okay. But, but I'm very curious. I'm really eager to ask you this question because uh, when you walked up, the first thing I noticed were your pants. <laughs> Your pants matching the wallpaper. Yes. And I want to know if it truly really was intentional and what if you could elaborate on that. <laughs> <laughs> it was entirely intentional. Um, I came to the opening last Thursday night and when I saw the set, I was like, oh, I have a pair of pants exactly that color. <laughs> I'm like, I have to wear those. And show your socks. Oh, and then of course, accented with pink and blue polka dots, <laughs> you know. So totally, totally purposeful. Good question. <laughs> Jefferson. By the way, a huge thanks to Jefferson Steele, who was able to cover us as a photographer this morning, because our um, normal photographer was out. Would you like an angle? Um, so I was watching the, the final sequence that you were doing with the palettes, uh -huh. and I was curious when you said you picked two colors, and the next day you picked another color. Were you looking back at the palettes the next day, or were you completely just picking a color out of your head, or did you something catch your eye and say, that's going to be the color today? or That. That. Yeah, I literally like I I purposely did not look at the rest. Um, every day I made a separate Illustrator file and I picked two colors and then I took one of those colors that day and put it into a file for the next day. Opened that file and added color. So I did not look at the colors before because I did not want to be influenced that oh I'm doing a lot of pinks this week or you know whatever. Um, but it, it did kind of coincidentally happen that I have like three or four times in the month that I picked black and like um, even like magenta, I kind of picked those colors more frequently. So it's kind of interesting. Yeah. As a designer, when you work with clients, um, have you, well you probably have, but how do you deal with clients who don't necessarily agree with your vision or are a little more difficult or like may not have a taste level that you approve of maybe? So I have a, a, sh a very short kind of funny story related to that. So over the last year, I rebranded the Albar and Belvedere and Company events, which used to be Truffles Catering. Um, and it was very funny throughout the, it's like five months we worked on the branding. Um, and multiple meetings I had with Sandra, which is one of the owners, um, she was like, I'm really not feeling that color. And I'm like, okay, well, what are you feeling? And like, I would show her what she thought she was feeling, and and later she would come back and say, I hate to tell you, but you were right. I like your color more. And it was kind of like that thing. It's like, don't try to push your color on someone. Keep that in the back of your head. Do it exactly what they want, and let them be the, the deciding factor that what they thought what they, they wanted is not what they wanted. And let you know, let them think what you did was their idea, because then it'll win. <laughs> Actually, what I want to ask was a few questions, a couple mm -hmm. questions. Um, when did you know that what you want to do is be a designer? 
Mm -hmm. And um, do you have, is there any place in Baltimore area where, like a prominent place where we would be able to see your work easily? Yes. Um, so wanting to be a designer, um, it kind of was happenstance for me. Um, I knew I was always interested in art and design. Um, from the time I can remember being a little, little kid, I wanted to be an architect, like, desperately. And I worked my entire life to get to that point. Got into college at Mississippi State University in the architecture program. And I was actually kicked out of the program because of affirmative action. And so I got kind of like, oh crap, what am I gonna do with my life? Uh, I'm a freshman in college, I don't know what I'm doing. But I had taken a drawing class that I really loved and I was like, I really like art. And I had never had a single drawing class or art class ever and got there and I was like, this is kind of awesome. And so I was already gonna think about minoring in art and I realized I was like, well what I really like is affecting change and that's what I thought as an architect I could do. Um, so design was that real, really that medium where a, I could get a job, <laughs> B, I could possibly make an income, and C, I could really affect change and use what I wanted to do, which was, you know, affect change. Um, so that kind of happened, and then once I got into design, I fell in love and couldn't look back and be happier. Um, the Locally, where you can see a lot of my work is just Mount Vernon. I've done a ton of stuff, you know, kind of here and there, done things for Doobies, um, the Belvedere, Belvedere, the Mount Vernon Belvedere Association, um, Midtown Benefits District. Um, I've done things just here and there, different, different things. I'm currently working on branding for a restaurant at the American Visionary Arts Museum that will be opening in the next couple of months. So the restaurant will be called Encantada, uh, which means dreamlike or spirited or haunted. Um, and so we're working on the menu for that and the designs for that, which would be kind of awesome. So you can kind of see those things kind of around. A lot of things in magazines, uh, do a lot of ads. Um, and so, yeah, that help? Um, just, just one more thing. Uh, you know, I'm just sort of getting started in art. I kind of picked it up, you know, I, it was something I did years ago and I'm picking it up again, so I'm having questions about certain mm -hmm. things. So if someone comes to me and say, oh, you know, is this warm or, or cool? I could say what's, it's, what is warm and what is cool, but I don't know what makes it warm or cool. Mm -hmm. And are there colors like, can you, can you have a blue that's neither warm or cool? Yes. As I kind of hinted at in the slide about the color green, um, my undergrad teacher used to tell me that everything is a shade of red, blue, or yellow. And so is that blue more yellow or more red? In that case, it becomes more warm. If it's more cool, it would be mixed with white or um, kind of a lighter shade that is, if, when you see it, it's kind of, you know, maybe not inviting or kind of like somber. Warm colors typically are a little bit more exciting, a little bit more, they give you a tingle inside and you feel like happy when you see it. Um, so it kind of just a gestalt, like you know what it is when you see it. Um, but typically reds are warm, typically yellows are warm. Um, oranges are always warm. Purples can be either or, you know. Greens can be either or because they're both mixed with blue. So does that make sense? Yes. So, somewhat, I mean, there's no, definitive answer because it's totally your perception and, I, and there's no way I can tell you how you're seeing color, but I can tell you how I see it. Like could you have a black that's cool and a black that's warm? Totally. Yeah, totally. You can have a very rich black um, in printmaking or in print design. Um, often I'll use what I consider called a rich black, which is CMYK, cyan, magenta, yellow, black, and 60, 60, 40, 100. So 60% cyan, 60% magenta, 40% yellow, 100% black. That's really warm and really rich and inviting. If you use pure black, it's gonna be kind of cold and, and eh. But you can also change your percentages of CMYK and make it very cool, so. There's like, just as the book is, there's 50 shades of gray, there's 100,000 shades of black, yeah. <laughs> yep. I'll get time for one more question. Right. <laughs> Actually, I just spontaneously decided you are the winner of the two from <laughs> Amadeus. <laughs> You're welcome. Let's just <laughs> applaud. What's your name? <laughs> Angela. Congrats. Oh, Angela. It's great. <laughs> <laughs> 
Um, this is a little bit um, away from color, but I'm really interested in your logo. Mm -hmm. um, can you kind of tell us a little bit about it and what it stands for? Yeah, so the deer. Um, being from Mississippi, um, I have an uh, affinity for animals and hunting and nature. Um, it's kind of a, a twofold thing. The deer kind of stuck with me at a certain point. Um, my undergraduate printmaking thesis was a series of screen prints that were all dealing with uh, camouflage and like orange vest and guns and arrows and bullets and, and bows and deer and rabbits and squirrels. Um, kind of playing off of the fact that it was kind of eye candy. It was colorful. It was fun. It was what I saw when I went hunting with my dad. Um, and you know, maybe it's a little hint of the fact that I didn't see things the way my dad did. Um, he saw hunting as a very manly thing. I saw it as a chance to be outside and look at the pretty colors, at the leaves. <laughs> and that's when I should have known I wanted to be a designer. Um, it didn't trigger just yet, but, um, and so, you know, seeing the, the fauna and, and the fawn, like, that really was inspiring. So that kind of, this particular deer actually was in one of my prints. And that kind of got translated into my self-promotional material as a graphic designer. Um, my promotional packet that I designed as a senior in college uh, got published in HAL Magazine um, in the International uh, Self-Publication Design Annual. And once it got published internationally, I was like, oh, well, that's my logo. Done. <laughs> <laughs> and something I've made modifications and changes over the years. Um, but it also kind of resembles the fact that, like, Every hunter wants to kill that big buck that has the big rack of antlers and like, you know, it's a trophy. And that's kind of how I want to perceive myself as a designer. I'm that trophy designer. You come after me and you're going to get the, you know, the 10 point or the 20 point buck and you're going to get the, the whole thing. You're not going to get a little, you know, weak, weak ass thing. Um, <laughs> so that's kind of where it kind of, no that's kind of my mantra. Huh? Do I? No Bambi situation. Yeah, no Bambi. Bambi's cute. No, I'm a buck. <laughs> so, yeah. Big round of applause for Wesley. Thank you. Thank you.